Okay, welcome, one and all. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, what a day, a gorgeous day. A nice place to be in the Palm Court. Uh, there's a powerful esprit de corps, certainly, in our fair city, for some certain reason. A luminous presence, which would be a, a, a Cubs victory here. So exciting. You know, it's my distinct pleasure. I'm Mike Murphy, and I direct Catholic Welcome. Well, I'm Mike Murphy, and I direct uh, Catholic Studies, and I'm uh, the Associate Director of the Haines Center. And on behalf of Loyola University of Chicago and the Haines Center, I want to welcome you to our 2016 Teilhard de Chardin Lecture. It's my pleasure, it's a distinct pleasure, to introduce uh, the Pope John F. Dean, who is our 2016 Teilhard Fellow in Catholic Studies. And John's been teaching a course here and has uh, also been doing some traveling and some writing um, while he's been here in Chicago. It's been a, a true delight to be with you this fall, John. Just uh, by way of introduction, John was born in Ackhill Island, just off the west coast of County Mayo in Ireland. And John, like Teilhard de Chardin, uh, was immediately and naturally confronted with luminosities of place, of realms that pulsate in between the terrestrial and the celestial, and those mysteries that exist between heaven and earth, mysteries that connect the body with the spirit, mysteries that reside between word and silence, mysteries given by the song of creation, the spaces between semi-breathe and the semi-breathe rest, the music that makes it all go. John's most recent publication is a collection of poems called semi-breathe, and semi-breathe is a musical term which means whole note, and then the rest is the absence of the note. You can see a connection. Um, this collection is yet another vital organ and a formidable corpus of work, a corpus that is characterized by an expansive gaze and a holistic vision, by integral reflection and careful reply, by listening. His vision expressed itself in several literary forms, and John has really published quite widely many collections of poetry, and he's also the recipient of three international awards for poetry. John has written three collections of short stories and also three novels. Last year, he published his faith memoir, Give Dust a Tongue, a work that embodies the spirituality and the sacrament the sacramentality of memory and poetics. I love that title, Give Dust a Tongue. It is the poet, in her use of the available materials, who gives dust a tongue. But this is only because he has been given a tongue by his maker. I can go on like this all day, but you didn't come to hear me. <laughs> it's Jack you came to see, and you're in for a treat. So let's welcome John F. Dean and his talk, A Luminous Absence, A Poetry and a Need for God's Absence. Um. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's working. Okay. It is a great uh, privilege, uh, challenge, and a pleasure to be here on a very auspicious occasion. I believe something happened last night because I heard fireworks actually. I thought it was three o'clock in the morning um, when I was up working hard and trying to get my act together. Um, you must also know, I hope, that the Irish rugby team are in town. Um, I did invite them all to come along, but um, they are rehearsing for a big evening dinner, I think. So, um, I'm just going to start off. Um, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. It saves me trying to set myself before you. But I am going to set myself before you in the way I like to do it best, which is with a poem. And it is called Sunny Grief. And it is a poem about writing poetry. And it's a poem about prayer, both together. I sat in the island of chapel, Moor's Edge, winter. Winds groaned and chiseled round the walls outside. The timbers creaked in the after warmth. Ghosts from the quenching 
slipped up through the rafters. There was a souring emptiness, though I sat entranced by sacrament and my own minuscule being. When the walls whispered, listen, there was no one, there was nothing. Even the winds had died, and the chill winter light had dimmed. But a tiny chime had happened, vibrated on my inner listening. The tiniest hint of spittle tipped against my brow, but there was nothing when I wiped my hand across it. The door moaned again, a sudden breeze forcing it, and I stood watchful and shaken. That was the first semi-breathe sounded of a gifted music. I am day and night now listening, tuned for it and waiting. So a poem about the arrival of inspiration, a poem about listening and being surprised by the spirit or the muse. It is about the gift of grace offered in prayer and sometimes if I listen well enough, it's given in poetry. I want to set a scene before you, a scene that you have had before your mind's eye many, many times before, but I think one that is always worth uh, resetting and refacing. It's barely dawn, the sun still merely a suspicion beyond horizons. The woman who has lost the one she most loved comes to the tomb with ointments oils, and an almost unbearable sorrow. She finds the tomb, and it is empty. The sorrow yaws even more across her being. She has lost that body. Now, this disappearance, this absence, has been added to the death. She turns away, wholly distraught. But this must have been the most devastating, the lowest point in the life of Mary Magdalene. The next moments are beautifully told in the Gospel of John. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you weeping? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And those are the strange words that I had not figured out, and I'm still not sure about them. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. She cannot hold him, though it is he. He has not yet left the earth, but his bodily. And so this special presence, which, it, which gives her new joy, is not a presence to be grasped and enfolded. I believe to understand this, we must go a bit further. This is without doubt the same Jesus she had known, the Jesus of body, face, hands, the Jesus of miracles, of healing. She had known him well. There is a way to get to know him better. There's a poem by W. H. Auden, an elegy in memory of William Butler Yeats. And this is just a little part of that poem. For him, it was the last moment as himself, an afternoon of nurses and rumours. The province of his body revolted. The squares of his mind were empty. Silence invaded the suburbs. The current of his feeling failed. He became his admirers. Now, if I can apply with reverence that last statement uh, to Christ himself 
on the day of his ascension, when at last he left Mary Magdalene and the disciples once more, as he had promised, I threatened. Those lines, he became his admirer. He became his admirers. In whatever sense one uses the word ascension, Jesus was now physically and finally absent from his followers, who returned in fear to the upper room in Jerusalem to wait. Christ had become, Christ had become his admirers. There's a lovely sequence of poems in a collection by our Nobel Prize winning poet Seamus Heaney, a collection called The Hall Lantern. And the sequence of poems is called Clearances. And it's about relationships between himself and his parents. There's a slight to and fro relationship between son and mother. Coming close, staying back, drawing close again, until one of the sonnets tells of her death and our awareness of what the title clearances becomes defined. Heaney talks about the simple foolishness of his father as he spoke to her on her deathbed. And this is the sonnet. In the last minutes, he said more to her almost than in all of their life together. You'll be in New Row on Monday night, and I'll come up for you, and you'll be glad when I walk in the door. Isn't that right? His head was bent down to her propped up head. She could not hear, but we were overjoyed. He called her good and girl. Then she was dead. The searching for a pulse beat was abandoned, and we all knew one thing by being there. The space we stood around had been emptied into us to keep. It penetrated clearances that suddenly stood open. High cries were felled, and a pure change happened. Those lines. The space we stood around had been emptied into us to keep. Death leaves such a space a gap and emptiness. But what had been there becomes a new presence within us. It is left to the survivors to hold that space and to hold what had been before tenant of that space. In a book of essays uh, Seamus Heaney had written, in 1939 an aunt of mine planted a chestnut in a jam jar. Americans, but I still hope you know what a chestnut is. Chestnut tree. Um, I have to do this every now and again because I see sometimes blank faces when I present something that I think should be very obvious. Um, but then I can figure out baseball from the start of the An aunt of mine planted a chestnut in a jam jar in 1939. When it began to sprout, she broke the jar, made a hole, and transplanted the thing under a hedge in the front of the house. Over the years, the seedling shot up into a young tree that grew taller and taller above the boxwood hedge. And over the years, I came to identify my own life with the life of the chestnut tree. 1939 was the year that Shen was born, and the year that the chestnut tree was planted. And of course, he admits to being a favourite of his aunt. So, he says, her affection for me came to be symbolised in the tree. Then he goes on to tell how the house was sold and they moved away. And the new owners eventually chopped down that chestnut tree. Then he writes, all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, I began to think of the space where the tree had been, or would have been. In my mind's eye, I saw it as a kind of luminous emptiness, a warp and waver of light. And once again, in a way that I find hard to define, I began to identify with that space, as years before I had identified with the young tree. 
I want to just emphasize that phrase. I saw it as a kind of luminous emptiness. And the other phrase, I began to identify with that space. Then there's another sonnet that tells of the cutting down and loss of the chestnut tree. And he equates this luminous emptiness with the death of his mother. I thought of walking round and round a space, utterly empty, utterly a source, where the decked chestnut tree had lost its place in our front hedge above the wallflowers. The white chips jumped and jumped and skited high. I heard the hatchet's differentiated, accurate cut, the crack, the sigh and collapse of what luxuriated through the shocked tips and wreckage of it all. Deep planted and long gone, my coeval chestnut tree from a jam jar in a hole, its heft and hush become a bright nowhere, a soul ramifying and forever silent, beyond silence listened for. In the summer of 2005, um, I had a phone call from famous Seamus. James Heaney. We did call him famous Seamus, and we called him his followers, the Heaney Boppers. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the Heaney Boppers weren't there, but a form of Heaney Bopper was, because nobody ever came to Dublin without wanting to meet famous Seamus. And occasionally, if he was really stuck with somebody, he would call me to come to the pub and help him chat with him. This was an Australian Jesuit priest uh, whom he barely knew, but who had written some pamphlets about him. So we chatted away for a good while and had a very nice evening. At the end of the evening, James stood up, uh, put his hand in his pocket, and said, John, I have a gift for you. Oh, I said, that's just great. Thinking, of course, he may next. Okay, it was a shame to me, something. <laughs> so he produced an acorn. Oh, I said, oh gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, and I put it in my pocket and went home. But just before I did go home, he said, that tree, that, that uh, acorn, by the way, he said, I picked it up when I was out in Walden Pond in Massachusetts in the retreat and cattle of Henry David Thoreau, whom you all know and love. That made a difference. I put the acorn in the deep freeze. It cracked over the winter. Uh, I put it into a, not a jam jar, a little pot, and it sprouted. And now we have it planted down in County Leitrim, where we have a little house. And it's about 16, 17 feet high. So it's the Seamus Heaney, Henry David Toro tree. And you come to Ireland, just a few dollars will allow you to climb that tree. <laughs> Every time I move, drive in the driveway of that house, Seamus Heaney, who is now dead, of course, Seamus Heaney comes to mind. Uh, his absence is actually luminous in the tree. In the same grounds as where we planted that tree, we had planted a young eucalyptus tree when the house was built. It's a fairly new house. The eucalyptus is not expected to flourish in the west of Ireland where it has been known to rain. And the eucalyptus likes hot climates. But this one was perverse <laughs> and grew at a terrible rate of knots, uh, topped the house, and we had to cut off the top of it. Then we had a bad winter, and the tree died over a long, long frost. I couldn't cut it down. I left it standing there for about two years. And then I felt very sorry for it, because it looked ragged and miserable. The bark was stripping off, etc. And then we had it cut down. It remains for me. This was actually done before famous Seamus was born, so I'm not plagiarizing him. Uh, the luminous absence in the hedge, where this enormous tree had been, um, was the impulse for a poem, which I have my own, which I call Eucalyptus. 
two years, the eucalyptus stood, dead in its place, the death angel hesitant to abandon it. I touched the bark, sorrow a sap rising within me. The tree had been inspiration, its yielding scent, its leaves quivering, its arms housed for a swarm of bees, crossroads for the snattering of goldfish, secret crannies for tree creepers or flycatchers. Its death was unspectacular, freezing where it stood through a desperate winter, held on, suffering the indignities of despoliation, skin shedding in long, dumb scabs and spoiling the lawn, till I knew the tree's love was an intensity that I had cherished. Chainsaw, finally, against its skin was a caress, guiding it to its fall, the slow creak of its splitting, the splintering, the stained glass of its lesser branches, the dull thump of its trunk against solid ground. All this a farewell, a plea for forgiveness. Then the angel left with a sigh. The emptiness that stood against the sky was a spirit lifted into air and held close after the flesh's long dormition. As far as I can understand it, Heaney's right loafer, or his emptiness that stood against the sky, suggests that a state of passivity or emptiness allows the contact with what is mysterious or uncertain to bypass reason and intellect and touch on a deeper and more instinctive yet deeply experienced area of response to stimuli. It is the moment where active thinking or study drops away, when more unguessed at, more unthought out conclusions take over and something new and of worth and beauty is discovered, is allowed through. Ine's mother departs the ground and enters her son's heart forever. Jesus ascends into heaven and enters with the Holy Spirit the lives of his disciples. The bereft, emptied person becomes porous, becomes permeable, as the disciples in the upper room after the ascension waiting. It is in poetry the capturing of the beautiful moving beyond reason and thought, beyond silence listened for, a faith beyond faith, grace. And does this luminous absence have anything luminous about it? It is an affective absence, affective, in the sense that the absence, having lost physical presence, brings about, or may bring about, emotions that are powerful, often stirring the memory to contemplation. The last book that James Heaney published in his lifetime came out in 2010, that's two years before he died, and it's called Human Chain. It's a collection that is deeply powerful, and yet I would think simpler in its language and emphasis than any of his earlier work. It was written or published about 23 years after Keirinson, but goes right back to that. It begins by touching on the absences that he referred to earlier. So it begins with elegies, and the most stirring of these recall his father and mother, still luminous absences in his life. There are two such elegies together, and he calls them uncoupled. The first touches on memories of his mother, where the poem allows the memory to speak for itself, thus letting the absence take on a luminosity, not hindered by his mother's actual presence, uncoupled. Who is this coming to the ash pit, walking tall, as if in a procession, bearing in front of her a slender pan withdrawn just now from underneath the firebox, 
waiting, full to the brim with whitish dust and flakes still sparkling hot that the wind is blowing into her apron bib, into her mouth and eyes, while she proceeds unwavering, keeping her burden horizontal still, hands in a tight sore grip round the metal knob, proceeds until we have lost sight of her, where the worn path turns behind the hen house. Simple, direct um, details, absolutely accurately remembered and recorded from 25, 30 years earlier, without a statement made, leaving the event to speak for itself. The memory of his mother is so detailed and calls on moments of childhood that there is no authorial intrusion into the poem. But the last line is deeply effective and suggestive. We have lost sight of her where the warm path turns behind the hen house. The other uncoupled part, the elegy to his father, is like that. Though this time the son is watching and involved. But the poem leads to a deeply moving statement of sadness and of loss. Who is this? Not much higher than the cattle, working his way towards me through the pen, his ash plant in one hand lifted and pointing, a stick of keel in the other, calling to where I'm perched on top of a shaky gate, waving and calling something I cannot hear, with all the lowing of the cattle, lorries revving at the far end of the yard, the dealers shouting among themselves and now to him, so that his eyes leave mine, and I know the pain of loss before I know the turn. In that precise scene there is a moment of extraordinary adult awareness, how much his father's ultimate absence from the son's life is going to hurt. He experiences a sense of loss before he even knows the exact meaning of the word loss. It's a late poem then, and a poem about the absences he touched on in his earlier work. However, these elegies in the beginning of the collection do not just stand on their own, though they do that. They are part of a whole movement which gives the book its title, Human Chain. And there is an awareness in that of how all of us are actually linked together as human beings. And reminds me very strongly of John Donne's unforgettable meditation on the bell, where he says, the bell doth toll for him that thinks it tolls. And though it intermit again, yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? But who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? But who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. This collection moves to the title poem, Human Chain, where he sees on television soldiers passing bags of food from one to another in order to help feed a starving people. To memories of sharing the handling of bags of grain when he was younger, as part of such a chain, and on to the sense of generations, one generation passing on and handing over to another generation. And this whole wonderful collection depends for its starting point 
on the love and sense of that luminous absence generated through those poems' appearances. In America, there is occasionally a very good poem written as well. <laughs> and I have found quite a few of those. And I'm going to give you one of them, uh, which puzzled me as well for quite a long time. Really, until I came to Chicago and discovered what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> uh, the title of it uh, is My Stop is Grand. Now, coming from an island on the west coast of Ireland, that made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me. However, it does now. Uh, it comes from Christian Wyman in his 2014 collection, which is called Once in the West. And it was the title, Once in the West, that drew me to the book, first of all. I thought, here's cowboy poems. They must be good. But they're not actually cowboy poems. My stop is grand. I have no illusion, some fusion of force and form will save me. Bewilderment of bone light, ungrave me. That's when the L, shooting through a hell of ratty alleys where nothing thrives but such and the rat-like lives that have learned to eat it, screechingly peek up a grace of sparks. So far out and above the fast curve that jostled and fastened us into a single shock of, I will not call it love, but at least some brief and no doubt illusionary belief that in some surge of brain we were all seeing one thing. Alone, unearned loveliness struck from an iron pen. Already it was gone. Already it was bone. The grey sky and the encroaching skyline, pecked so clean by raptor night. I shuddered at the cold gleam we hurtled toward, like some insentient herd, plunging underground at Clark and Division. And yet all that day I had a kind of vision that's never gone completely away of immense clear-paned towers and endlessly expendable hours through which I walked teeming human streets, filled with a shine that was most intimately me and not mine. An extraordinary poem, very powerful. Uh, the sharing of a moment um, of what he calls beauty, as sparks peacocking can be. Whenever I travel on the L, I am bemused and amused, as I said facing these 12 people. They're all <laughs> down with this. And I am gazing out at the wonders of Chicago. Um, anyway, he says, I have no illusion, some force or fusion will save me. A grace of sparks. I will not call it love, but that really is what he intends. In one surge of brain, we were all seeing one thing. A lone, unearned loveliness, struck from an iron pen. And though it is a momentary thing, he admits that all that day, I had a kind of vision that's never gone completely away. The point of this, too, is that word, unearned, suggesting that the poem was not immediately worked for, but that the poet was in that state of negative capability that Keats uh, so wonderfully outlined. He was permeable to experience and its relevance, that all the work, experience, thought and notes, etc., that had gone before, now issued through the medium of the moment into inspiration into the poem. It's the difference when you're writing between the word composed and the word given. Composed suggests the intellect at work, imposable from within. Given suggests being open, 
listening, accepting from absence what the whole being is often unintentionally waiting for. That luminous absence that opens into sudden presence. And Wyman quotes the phrase of Ezra Pound. How can I know what I think until I see what I've said? There's a beautiful short poem by another almost American poet born in Wales, Denise Levertov, called The Avowal. Um, but the title is followed by a very interesting dedication. For Caroline Kaiser and John Woodbridge, recalling our celebration of George Herbert's birthday, 1983. George Herbert, of course, is the great poet of the presence of Christ, and the poet who pleaded for simplicity and love that he might be able to face the master with some integrity. Levitard's work was linked to Herbert's, and that she too, in her latter work, sought that same simplicity and immediacy, as here she wishes she could float into the embrace of God, the Avala. As swimmers dare to lie face to the sky, and water bears them, as hawks rest upon air, and air sustains them. So I would learn to attain free fall, and float into Creator Spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all-surrounding grace. The linking of the poem to George Herbert captures the same hope of Herbert's, to benefit by an unearned and freely given gift of God's love, a gift of inspiration that she calls Creator Spirit's deep embrace, received by the soul only when, in acknowledgement of its own weakness, it leaves itself open to that divine gift, to allow the absence to take its place in the heart. In a talk Levertov later gave, published in a book called The Poet in the World, she talks about poems which seem to appear out of nowhere, complete or very nearly so, which are quickly written without conscious premeditation, taking the writer by surprise. And she adds, these are often the best poems. However, she goes on to clarify that a luminous emptiness may simply remain a luminous emptiness without the labour that writing poetry actually entails. I believe the same labour applies to prayer. And there is a poem by the wonderful George Herbert that addresses poetry and prayer together. The poem begins with a sense of this absent God. Herbert's prayers, he said, could not pierce God's silent ears, and this broke his heart and marred his verse. He prayed hard on his knees, calling for God to be present, but no hearing. Now his soul lay, he writes, out of sight, untuned, unstrung, and discontented. The poem is called Denial. It has that uh, supremely beautiful phrase that Michael referred to in it. When my devotions could not pierce thy silent ears, then was my heart broken, as was my verse. My breast was full of fears and disorder. My bent thoughts, like a brittle bow, did fly asunder. Each took his way, some were to pleasures go, some to the wars and thunder of alarms. As good go anywhere, they say as to be numb both knees and heart in crying night and day, come, come, my God, oh, come, but no hearing. Oh, that thou shouldst give dust a tongue to cry to thee, and then not hear it crying. All day long my heart was in my knee, but no hearing. Therefore my soul lay out of sight, untuned, unstrung, my feeble spirit 
unable to look right like a nipped blossom, hung discontented. O cheer and tune my heartless breast, defer no time, that so thy favours granting my request, they and my mind may chime and mend my rhyme. It was a gift of God that his bent thoughts are straightened out, and that his soul might be tuned to truth and find contentment. In his most, I think, powerful poem, one of his very short ones, and one of the most beautiful short poems ever written, um, the tables are turned, and God invites the soul to come, and the soul resists because the soul is now aware, I'm made of dust, so how can I dust, how can I come to you? The soul resists, and the poem contains a beautiful little drama of resistance, and finally of yielding. You know the poem very well. It's uh, one of the most beautiful poems about presence, and the soul being absent. Love, badly welcome. But my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look at thee. Love took my hand and, smiling, did reply, Who made the eyes but I? True, Lord, but I did mar them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, said Love, who bore the blame? My Lord, then I will serve. You must sit down, said Love, and share my meat. So I did sit and eat. Again, the great lesson for both poetry and prayer is this letting go, letting go of the resistance that we have intellectually or physically, reasonably, uh, to allow ourselves to be open. There is another wonderful American poet, crazy of course, uh, in her own beautiful way most extraordinary life ever lived, I think, of Emily Dickinson, um, who fought with herself all the time, and fought with God's absence for a lot of the time, and vacillated hugely between acceptance and denial. But she has one beautifully whimsical poem that I like very much, and I'm going to put this in here just to cheer myself up. <laughs> she says, I never felt at home below, and in the handsome skies I shall not feel at home, I know, I don't like paradise, because it's Sunday all the time, and recess never come, and evening will be so lonesome, bright Wednesday afternoon. If God could make a visit, or ever took a nap, so not to see us, but they say, he is himself a telescope and perennially beholds us, I would just run away from him and from the Holy Ghost and all of them. But then there's the judgment day. I don't like paradise because it's Sunday all the time. One can hear the voice of a girl, all dressed up for Sunday services, laced and tautened and watched, while she longs to be free of the finery and go live in the real world. And which would be the easiest? For God to pay a visit? Or if he were to fall asleep so that she could run away from him? Then she would wish to disappear completely and, however, God has his telescope. So although he's absent, he's watching all the time. I have a long roundabout story to tell about why 
I am here as a Tehagashad fellow in my own university, but I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> but it's a great one. <laughs> Someday I will let it all out, the story behind it. Um, the simplest thing about it all was that I was introduced to uh, Teilhard de Chardin's work by a seminarian with whom, when I was a seminarian, I uh, went to University College Dublin and we cycled in and out every day. He spoke no English when we met in the bishop, and I had French. So I was appointed to be his French assistant. We were studying French and English together, and this particular day, our French teacher did not turn up at all. But we, being good seminarians, stayed right to the end of the class that wasn't happening anyway. He put his hand into his pocket and took out a little book, which was called La Messe sur le monde, the Mass over the world. It was 1965, a long time ago. And we read that together in French uh, in the classroom, and it sank so much into my heart and soul that um, I never forgot Théa de Chardin. I have pursued my love of him down the years. Um, I was quietly assisted, would be a nice way to put it, out of the seminary. Eventually, <laughs> whereas he stayed on. And I was out here for about a week when I had an email telling me that this same guy whom, who introduced me to Teatro Chardin has now been made one of the 17 new cardinals by Pope Francis. And he is now the Cardinal Archbishop of Mauritius. So I want to make some use of. Awesome at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to get to Mauritius. In 1923, when he was in the interior of Mongolia, in the desert, working on a site where Stone Age utensils had been discovered, Father Teilhard Chardin wrote a text called La Messe sur le Monde, Mass over the World. It's really a poem in prose but holds within it the whole future of the investigation into evolution, and holds too the passage in Romans 8, where St. Paul speaks of the whole of creation groaning in labour to share in the glory of the children of God. What inspires La Messe sur le monde is the absence of the bread and wine in the shadow's hands that would have allowed him to say Mass there in the Nover of Mongolia. So he substitutes for the bread all the labor of all humanity. And he substitutes for the wine all the suffering and blood that is shed by humanity. And here's a short piece uh, from the beginning of the work. Since Lord, once again in the steppes of Asia, I have neither bread nor wine nor altar. I will lift my spirit above symbols to the pure majesty of reality. And I will offer you, I, your priest, on the altar of the whole earth, the work and suffering of the world. The sun has just lit with radiance down below the furthest fringe of the eastern sky. And once again, under the moving sheet of its fires, the living surface of the earth awakes, trembles, and begins again its terrifying labour. I will place on my pattern, O oh God, the anticipated harvest of this new effort. I will pour into my chalice the sap of all the fruits that will be pressed out this day. My chalice and my pattern are the depths of a soul, wholly open to all the forces which in a moment will rise up from all the corners of the globe and converge towards the Spirit. I pray that they be given to me the memory and the mystical presence of all those whom the light will waken into a new day. Also a form of luminous absence that actually I think has changed for the better the thinking of Christianity and hopefully eventually all of humanity. 
So with prayer and trust in prayer, for we need to trust in that absence that seems to attend our prayer. We need an emptiness, a luminous absence that wants to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And precisely that is the definition of centering prayer, a form of contemplative prayer that comes after a long tradition of monastic contemplation has been adapted to be suitable for every human being in any and every walk of human life. Thomas Keating, in his book, Open Heart, Open Mind, explains, in centering prayer, we withdraw our attention from the ordinary flow of thoughts. We tend to identify ourselves with that flow. But there is a deeper part of ourselves, the spiritual level. Centering prayer opens our awareness to this deep level of our being. I was brought up to pray, and from my very earliest years was given the words to use. But praying that way is a one-way system. It's a barraging God with words. God who will already know, anyway, what is in my mind to pray for and about. Centering prayer is an attempt to empty the mind of thoughts, images, words, in order to attain a level of interior silence that will allow God to be present to us and work within us. Same as inspiration for a poem. Christian Weinberg, whom I quoted earlier, writes, Our minds are constantly trying to bring God down to our level rather than letting him lift us into levels of which we were not previously capable. That's from an extremely wonderful memoir study called My Bright Abyss. The title, of course, touching very much on luminous absence. Just another way of uh, converging on the same subject, if you like. Exciting on various parts of the world, a certain kind of outlook does seem to be growing. There's another very nice American poet, a uh, young guy called Fred Marchant, uh, whom I'm very fond of. And he lives in Boston and has been teaching out there. And he has a very short, simple poem, which I like comes to a nice little circle around what I've been talking about. It's called First Song Again. First Song Again. It must be clean out here because we have to <laughs> annoy our heads. Trust all the wood you stand on. Become an ally of the grain. Bend in the wind. Trust even the high precarious places, the steeples and windy overhangs that teach you everything. Trust too the rose tint of late afternoon sifting down through a lofted blue heron wing. Trust above all the imminent return of the small but persistent impulse to sing. And if I were to read that poem again and substitute the title, First Prayer, again, it would work exactly the same. I want to finish with a poem of my own. Um, and it's about where I started with one of my great heroes in life, Mary Magdalene, and another great hero of my own life, Declan, being my brother, who was a Jesuit priest, and who died in California, Tanzania, 10. That was only seen like yesterday. I always have to think about 2010. This poem is based on the translation by a man called Willis Barnstone which he calls the Restored New Testament. 
He's an expert in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and has gone right back to the origins of the New Testament. And what excited me about it was the names of people have become fresh again. So Jesus is no longer just Jesus, which is a harsh enough sort of name. He's the Yeshua in the original. Mary Magdalene is Miriam of Magdil. John, a hard stone of the name, is actually Johannan. I like it. The poem happened. It is a gift. While I was in the Holy Land on pilgrimage with uh, nice people, good people. And we were, we had crossed the Lake of Galilee in a boat, and of course, uh, it being run by clerics, a storm happened right in the middle of the lake, <coughs> well organized, and we had fun for a while, and then it stopped. We got into a bus and came from there, around the lake, back towards the hotel that we were staying in. Um, as we passed along, down the left, I saw this uh, place that was roped off, and they were obviously doing excavations. Um, my brother Declan was an alcoholic, and a very bad alcoholic. And he had very hard years, but he surfaced from it and survived. And he spent his last two years, I think, in a place called Pleasant Hill in California. And the only time he ever wore the oops, wore the collar and the full regalia was when he was picketed outside the gates of San Quentin whenever there was to be an execution. So they actually loved him. Uh, down around there. My father had died not terribly long before that. The name of our bus driver was Israel, and the name of the local guy was Abraham. Um, this kind of did happen to me. It was giving, and I spent about two days in a sort of a ecstasy, if you like, writing this. And I want, to, I want you to just think of the whole Mary Magdalene thing and the loss, sense of loss and the sense of uh, the absence that actually goes in to the heart and becomes warmer and closer even than the physical presence. Encounter. It is March. In Ireland, daffodils will be suffering the harshest winds. Here, the coach had turned back from the slopes of the Beatitudes towards Tiberius. To the right, the valleys, green and flush, rising to the hills. To the left, the lake, quietened in an evening lull and pleasuring. I settled in my seat, comforted and tired. When? This is my wakeful dream. This is the happening, the real. In the coach seats opposite, father, fisherman, and a March month birthday boy, and brother, Declan, impatient God lover, picture by the gates of San Quentin, celebrant of falling free at last from alcohol addiction. Both of them in animated conversation. Both of them dead for years and months. They spoke in a language without words, song-like, seductive. Outside, darkness was falling early. The sun, a dying fire. Light catching on the thorn of the moon that was lying idle in a sapphire-shaded heaven. Soon, there would be shimmering silver night rays out across the sea. Father suddenly called to me and pointed. 
the bus stopped. And we stepped down, we three only. Silently, they walked across the grass, down towards the shore. Drawn and confused, I followed. The light so faint now, all was shadow. Father, old friend and faithful, veteran, brother and priest. The old man turned to me and said, We, he smiled, we are not in death. We are in life. He pointed. There was another standing near the lake, her back to us. She was watching out over the water, frail bold, slight but firm. Mother? I said. And she turned slowly. I did not know her. Fair skin, handsome, but not beautiful. Your name? I asked. Miriam, she said. Miriam of Mindale. And yours? Johannan, I answered to my surprise. Around us, ruins only. Excavations, stone pumps, heaps. Mindale? It was here, she said. He stepped ashore from the fishing boat and stood a while gazing towards the hills. I was kneeling there by that great rock. I was gutting fish for Sultan. I worried for his feet, naked against the sharp edges of the shells. The others, fishermen, moved awkwardly, hauling the boat ashore, uncertain of themselves. And who are you? I asked him, though I already knew the answer. He is the way. He is the life, and his truth will sear both soul and body. And he said, Miriam, as if he knew me. If I give, he said, word of myself, what can that be to you? Come and see. And I left fish and shore, lake and village, and followed him. He is invasion, hero, mystery. He is the centre, he is forgiveness, light. And now I, she said, am in death no longer. I am in life. She smiled, turning back towards the sea. I glanced for father, brother, but they were not there. And when I turned again, she too had disappeared. I shivered suddenly, alone and cold. A black-backed gull perched on the great rock was stabbing down at some small feathered thing. Now it was night. From the road, Abram was calling out to me, and I came back at peace, heavy in my flesh, but free. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh,